Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fact Dev Lounge podcast, your faculty development podcast for Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Today, I have two people with me, Lynette Reed and Sonia Stanojevic, and I'm so pleased that you're here today to talk about some curriculum changes, which sounds so exciting to talk about on a podcast, but it's actually really great to talk about because there's some really exciting changes. So I'm going to hand it over to both of you to introduce yourselves and your positions at Dalhousie University and what we're going to talk about today. So maybe, Lynette, I'll hand it over to you first. Okay, thanks so much, Sarah. It's great to be here and to have this opportunity to talk to a broad audience. Um, this curriculum changes actually touch everyone in medical education. My name's Lynette Reed, as you said. I'm in the Department of Bioethics, so I uh, come into my engagement with medical education actually from a philosophical background and with medical ethics. Uh, I was involved quite a bit in the curriculum renewal 12 years ago when we were opening the DMMB campus and refreshing, renewing our curriculum at that time. And uh, we've been doing in the last couple of years a curriculum refresh, um, not as uh, thoroughgoing, or I mean not as structural as last time. We're not changing units, we're not renaming units, we're not completely, you know, we're not creating new units. But we're making some pretty deep changes to the curriculum, actually, and to curriculum materials. Um, so it's a different process this time around. And this time we're really taking an equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility lens, uh, and an anti-oppressive lens to what we're doing. So it's going to be a little bit more permutating everything we do, uh, but, uh, but not like rewriting whole units. What did you notice, Lynette, in the curriculum? You're like, okay, we're due, we're due for some changes. Early in the process, when we were doing a curriculum retreat, maybe almost two years ago, I was asked to come and say a little bit about things that have changed since the last curriculum. And when I sat down to make the slide to express that, it really hit home to me. When we did the curriculum 12 years ago, the Truth and Reconciliation Report wasn't even out. Uh, the Me Too movement hadn't happened. Black Lives Matter hadn't happened. We weren't living in a world when neo-Nazis were marching in the streets uh, 12 years ago. That was unimaginable 12 years ago, absolutely unimaginable that we would actually be facing a new era in which positions might have to take a stand against that kind of politics, um, as has always been their ethical obligation. So... There was even more, the list was even longer. Like, I mean, of course everyone knew about climate change, but Greta Thunberg and, and, and the regular attention to the reality of climate change through events we read about in the newspaper and are experiencing in our own uh, apartments right now uh, was not uh, around. So uh, just so much was on the list. Murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls is discussed now very differently. The residential schools and the finding of... of um, of the children who died in these schools. All these things all happen, like so much has happened in the last 12 years. Trans rights, the, the, the broad acceptance and understanding of transgender identities was not anywhere near where it is today. So when I made that slide, I was like, oh my gosh, uh, a lot has changed. And I was very involved in designing and rolling out the professional competencies units, so quite familiar with how we'd approached um, community health issues 12 years ago. And that's what I see. I could say a bit more about what we see in the curriculum itself that we're changing, but I would say that was really the impactful thing for me. Yeah, and I think even the connection with some of the um, some of the issues that you mentioned, and I'll pick up uh, on climate change, that just the whole conversation around planetary health and how the connection between um, the Earth and our planet, and and how I think people may have thought those to be two separate things. And I think any of us who are paying attention in healthcare and otherwise realize that they impact each other. Um, and I taught ProComp, the original um, curriculum, when DMMB opened. I was one of the facilitators. And I remember actually feeling quite proud at the time of some of the issues that we were talking about and and um, the approach to things like um, care with uh, patients with neurodiversity. You know, I'm a pediatrician, so I think about autism a lot, um, things like that. So, so we had done pretty well, but then now we've recognized that, like, we can do better, which is it's such a great phase, you know, phrase to use because we're trying to do well, but we can always do better and we're always learning. So Sonia, what do you think is the most exciting change that you're excited for? Introduce yourself and tell us who you are and then tell us um, some of the exciting changes you're excited for. Uh, 
Sure. Um, so I'm Sonia Stanovich. I'm an uh, epidemiologist and biostatistician in the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology at Dell. Um, and my research is predominantly in respiratory health. So lung growth and development in childhood and then how that relates to developing lung disease in adulthood um, and and through my research and kind of how the lungs work and what happens across the life course we've grappled with this idea of the environment and how where you live and your background and how that influences your growth and development and so in my own research we we've come across really reevaluating the use of race-based medicine and so it's a real privilege to be able to bring some of the things that I've learned through through my research and questioning race-based practices in, in respiratory health to how that translates into the curriculum. And so it's been really rewarding to work with Lynette and the team to really you know, think about our assumptions. So one of the things that was most striking to me is is we just get so ingrained in in how it's always been done and and challenging paradigms and and thinking about the evidence that supports clinical decisions it's so challenging to to have these conversations and for me it was this what if we were wrong what if all this time we assumed one thing we looked at the evidence in one way and now thinking about anti-oppressive practices it's just it's everywhere and every time you think about what we've done and unless you have an anti-oppressive lens unless you're questioning why we do things unless you're questioning the evidence we run this risk of just perpetuating these disparities that many of us aren't even aware that we're making um, in, in respiratory medicine the use of race-based reference equations to interpret lung function came out of a good place. It came out of trying to do things better. It came out of trying to reduce disparities in one area. And we completely missed that we were introducing disparities in a whole nother way. Um, and so over the last two years, we've really been questioning this practice and thinking about solutions, but solutions that don't introduce new disparities, that don't disadvantage one group over another. And, and that's been really challenging and rewarding too and then to see that translate into the curriculum is really exciting mm. well lynette you you and i know that there's a big group trying to really look at the language we're using in cases and um the examples we're using is that something that you wanted to talk about to faculty today is about how we're kind of making even just those like very i don't know if the word's logistic but just those very meaningful changes that aren't big curriculum moments, but just even how we use language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to describe that. That's work um, since uh, since January. Uh, and Sarah, and full disclosure, everyone in this conversation is on that working group and advisory group. Um, so um, this was an initiative that came from UTME. Evelyn Sutton invited us to form a working group to um, <clears throat> to look at the cases which had already been reviewed for demographic details, all 200 cases that students discuss in the CBL curriculum in the first two years. And that's in, it's 200 sessions, sometimes sessions have two cases. Um, and uh, that includes ProComp and the block units, what are called the block units. Um, and those cases have been reviewed and we found that by and large people only have their racial identities, ethnic identities, um, disability status, uh, sexual orientation, and uh, gender nonconforming sex and gender identities named where that's the topic of the case or where it's a clue to diagnosis or management. And so the only newcomers in the cases, say the only immigrants and refugees in the cases, were where we were teaching immigrant and refugee health or where there was a point about the, it being a student who was receiving care was from a particular country where a condition was more prevalent. And there's a lot of discussion in the medical education literature now of how that has led to medical stereotyping. Or for example, patients with obesity are only discussed in the context of lifestyle modification counseling. And um, that medical stereotyping means that genuinely when a physician that sees a black patient, they think, oh, what are those diseases that are prevalent in the black communities that I'm supposed to see here? We can talk more about the complexities of prior probabilities and all that in a moment, but 
But the stereotyping process where people take other conditions off the differential diagnosis because over and over again in medical school they only saw black people where it was a sickle cell case or they only saw disabled people around a UTI from uh, involved with sitting in a wheelchair. Um, that sort of stereotyping is a real concern increasingly discussed in medical education. And um, it's nice the trans community has a great phrase for this, which I think everyone can identify with. If you have one of these identities that, that triggers what somebody learned for an exam or what somebody saw in their medical school cases, they call it the trans broken elbow syndrome. Like you go in to see the doctor, you've got a broken elbow, and they only learned about trans people in the context of care for trans people and hormones and surgery and counseling and for gender uh, identity. Uh, and so, you know, it can get hard, get hard to pay, get someone to pay attention to the elbow. And we've heard that just as an informal kind of anecdotal statement when our simulated patients have an elevated BMI. Um, whatever the scenario that they're there for, students will sometimes start to counsel them in OSCEs, in the OSCE setting or in the case practice setting about lifestyle modification. And that might not be the, the point of the case. And um, activists for fat acceptance have been documenting that and studying that for years to say that, that there are a lot of neglected medical needs for patients who um, have an elevated BMI. And Sarah knows we've had conversations around the whole BMI question in our working group, but um, that there's a real stereotyping that goes on there that can be a bias that can prevent people from seeing uh, and reasoning properly diagnostically. So... Um, it's, it's fascinating to me because the BMI one, for instance, because like yes. in pediatrics, we don't, yeah. we care about BMI, but then we don't. And it's kind of, it comes yeah. in, and vo in and out of vogue and things like this. But I think, and Sonia, I'd be so interested as an epidemiologist, what you think of this, because do we not in medicine try to look for patterns, fit people into algorithms, fit them into a box. It's much easier to learn, to memorize, to conceptualize. And so then if I know that your BMI is supposed to be... 20 or something, you know, um, then, then I have a goal. I have an anchor to set my sights to rather than looking holistically at the patient and what their goals are and what their needs are and what it even matters to them in terms of their health. Um, and I think that would apply to, you know, what is a normal CBC in an, in an African Canadian person, um, those numbers might be different. And how do we, how do we teach that? And how do we, um, take that lens? I'd love your thoughts on that. So I'm nodding. People can't see me nodding. Um, <laughs> so Sarah, this is, this is exactly what I've been thinking. So, so epidemiology is a very powerful tool to describe trends and patterns in the population. And it's incredibly useful to understand, you know, where we might put resources or how we might address you know, things at a population level. The challenge that I think we have is translating that epidemiology to an individual patient. And so we talk about the likelihood that you kind of follow a certain pattern, but that doesn't represent the person, the person sitting in front of you, the person you need to make the clinical decision about is, is dynamic, is diverse, has, you know, I, when I talk about lungs, I say people's lungs come in all shapes and sizes. And we can try to use prediction models. We can try to use clinical algorithms to, to inform. But I think one of the things that has, been quite eye-opening to me is when we look at these prediction models, these clinical algorithms, and you ask yourself, who was included in developing them? How was race, ethnicity, somebody's sex or gender used in those algorithms? And if you look back at the evidence, most of our clinical algorithms come from people of white European ancestry. Visible minorities are not included in a lot of our research studies. They're not included in these algorithms or they're race specific. So there's an algorithm for people of white European ancestry and then an algorithm for African Americans or there's an algorithm for other. Um, and that doesn't necessarily help us make better clinical decisions in individuals. It just tells us more broadly what happens in the population. And something that's been kind of relevant in, in the research that I've done is if we think about social determinants of health, none of our clinical algorithms, none of our clinical measures actually account for the fact that the social determinants of health are this unmeasurable influence on people's health that we don't really consider. And so if we think about 
clinical algorithms for lung function, we compare people to other healthy individuals, a non-smoker without respiratory disease. But what about the influences of the environment? What about the influences of nutrition and air pollution? And all those things are predominantly influencing, or I should say, are negatively influencing minority populations, disadvantaged populations. And we don't consider those things in those algorithms. And so when com someone comes into the clinic and they're in the normal range, what does that actually tell us? What, you know, so, so using, I think we, I think in general, we have to start thinking more holistically about the patient, their background, their circumstances, their symptoms, why that test is being done for them and and trying to take a more holistic approach and that's why i really like in the case diversification we're giving medical students a much broader perspective of the environment the social circumstances the background of an individual and i think that helps them to appreciate that that the answers aren't binary that two people that look different and have the same symptoms won't necessarily have the same diagnosis. Two people that look the same with different symptoms won't have the same diagnosis. And, and really starting to think about the diversity of our patients, not just in what color they are, or how they self-identify, but, but really about the, the lived experience that they're coming with. That's a, an amazing summary of of things I didn't even think of. I think a lot about the social determinants of health and I've never thought out loud about when I'm doing a test, like cause sometimes you do. And I've trained, you know, I trained not just yesterday. So I have some of those influences of putting things definitely into these box and these biases. And so when I, I don't think I've checked my own biases when it comes to the social determinants of health in that way, um, enough because you're right. Like if I do a pulmonary function test on an adolescent, what is my goal is like, cause the goal is always sort of the sense of normal. Um, but then you're trying to meet people where they're at in, in almost a harm reduction approach, because I can't necessarily change their housing. I can't necessarily change their passive cigarette smoke. Um, I certainly give it a go to try to change their vaping habits, but we all know how, um, successful that can be at times. Lynette, are we also in the curriculum considering how we're teaching our learners and relearning ourselves this much more holistic and um, I hope that word's okay, holistic, because I really like it. I talked to Catherine Smart in a podcast just recently about that word. It means we're looking at the whole. It means we're looking at the person. Are we... Is that making medicine too complicated? Because we're inserting <laughs> ourselves into a healthcare system that I've worked in yeah. for almost 20 years. And it, our hospital systems like systems, they like processes, yeah. they like to know which patient is going which place and what clinic and what for. Yeah. Um, is this the face of the change of medicine? Is this the change we want and we think that our patients need, that we'll need when we're patients? Or are we sending them into the wolves to say, we've taught you differently, but now you have to insert yourself in a system that has no flexibility. <laughs> um, I hope I don't get really fired which, for that one. <laughs> no, really, which questions you're raising. I mean, I think uh, Sonia's work demonstrates that these are changes that are happening all over all at once. So maybe there's an old idea that we teach medical students the latest science and then they carry it out into practice and then we see if practice changes as they occupy positions of leadership. I think of this as change that's happening all over at once. So Sonia's working with her international organizations on updating their policy responses to government on the use of race-based um, lung function adjustments and so on. And Presumably, when you open your medical journal, there's going to be articles about this. It's happening across all specialties. It's not just lung function. And I speak as somebody with a history in the history and philosophy of science, and we've often had these case studies where we thought, here's an area in medicine where, for example, the history of schizophrenia was a very racialized history. It was a disease of white women uh, in the 1950s and 60s and a very genteel disease. And oddly enough, around the time of... Uh, of um, black power movements in the United States and the civil rights movement, it became a disease of angry black men. Uh, really fascinating history, really fascinating history. So I think in philosophy and history of science, we thought there were these case studies. And something that's fascinating to me now is to watch everybody realize this in all their areas of practice. Uh, whether it's rheumatology, we've heard at the curriculum retreat, uh, just individuals having that revelation. If they open 
their own textbooks, if they look at this statement that black people are more likely to this and white Europeans are more likely to this. And by the way, we call them Caucasians because we think that's polite and we don't realize that actually Caucasian is itself a term with a, with a racist history. It's not really the polite way to say right, white, even though it sounds sort of Latin and better, it's not the polite way to say white. Um, it's happening all over medicine right now. So I think it's more of an entire culture change and we're part of that and we're hoping to support, really support tutors, support case writers, support unit heads um, as they're sorting through this and as everybody's undergoing these changes. It's really our perspective. I don't know if that answers your questions, but there's a, because there is another dimension of your question that is standardization versus patient-centeredness. Really important question. Yeah. And is it more complex to be patient-centered? Or is it more uh, complex to treat people like they're all the same and then have to pick up the pieces afterwards when you find that it didn't work for, um, for a lot of people? Oh my gosh, that is a great philosophical question because I feel like you're right. It's sort of chicken and an egg thing. Do you do the standardized approach first and then see if you can add on the other layers? You know, the, we teach students about problem lists Again, talked about this in a previous podcast where it's kind of like cardiovascular disease, diabetes. We've added, you know, maybe smoker now or their or their known evidence based cardiac risk factors, and then it's kind of like psycho other psychosocial complex psychosocial problems, and and you know to your point, Sonia, about like, hmm, well, what if their complex psychosocial problems are actually the first problem, and that their basic human needs aren't being met, and how are we looking at people differently if we really want to move? the needle on, on people's health. I can't resist sharing something because it just came on our emails this week. And maybe I can hear your reactions to a real life example, not to put you on the spot, but like the New Brunswick Medical Society and the Chief Medical Officer for Health came out talking about monkeypox. And, you know, and this is, this is global, right? Where people are talking about how it's more prevalent, if that's the proper word, um, in men who have sex with men. And then the paragraph that came out for our local education is monkeypox can affect anyone, you know, however, transmission has been observed with primarily individuals identifying as gay, bisexual, or other men having sex with men. And I just find that so fascinating because the narrative in other countries is this is a disease of men who have sex with men. And and is it is it far enough to just lean into that, you know, this can affect anyone, but this is where we're seeing it from an epidemiological standpoint that might be a fact, like this is just a fact, but of course it can happen to anyone. And so are we, are we seeing that change even in our politics and in our advocacy and in our leadership? So I have to say that, I mean, Lynette, I'll bring up the, the sickle cell and CF scenario because I think it's a, it's a parallel that we've been discussing. So... I work in respiratory, CF is cystic fibrosis, it's, it's my main area of research. And, and it's been really interesting to see that evolve. So about five years ago, even two years ago, every CF um, website, every organization, CF is a, the most common genetic disease in Caucasians or the most common disease in white people. And I think the same happens in sickle cell. There's a perception that sickle cell is only occurs in, in black individuals. And so, you know, if we think about it happens to everyone, anyone can get cystic fibrosis, anyone can get sickle cell. And it was certain geographical distributions in terms of where the disease is more likely, but people do live in different environments. Our environment, our po the population that we come from do influence your pretest probability. So when we say anybody can get CF, anybody can get monkeypox, that doesn't mean that the risk is the same in everybody. It means that we have to think m more about the individual, the individual's behaviors, what the, those risk factors are for the disease to then determine what the risk is for an individual sitting in front of you. Because again, at the population level, yes, cystic fibrosis is more common or more prevalent in people of European ancestry. Sickle cell is more prevalent in people 
with an African ancestry. But but if we if we perpetuate those stereotypes, then our learners do leave thinking, well, this only happens in white people, or this only happens in in men who have sex with men. And I think that's what we want to try to disrupt and and recognizing that anybody can get any of these diseases. And how do you make those good clinical decisions based on the person sitting in front of you, not making assumptions based on these stereotypes that are still being perpetuated everywhere in medicine. Mm. And we want our students to be open and to be contemplative and to, yeah, think outside and really kind of check their biases, like I was saying before. So how are we going to, how are we going to teach that? One thing I love about the case diversification process is that we have 200 cases to work with at least. And some of the sessions have more than one case. So it's really an unprecedented opportunity. We're actually going to give everybody's identity up front. So there's no more just stating somebody's black when it's a clue to the disease they have or that somebody uh, has sex with people of the same gender when it's a clue to a diagnosis. We're going to state it for everybody. That will be a new experience for tutors. and for I mean, the students are new in the first year. They, don't, they haven't experienced the old cases. So there are no new or old experience for students, but it'll be a new experience for tutors. It might be a new experience for students, because, I, I mean, I say speaking as a white person, nobody ever describes me as white. And that's sometimes why we call, we talk about racialization, not race, because everybody's got a race. We can have a long discussion about the history of ideas of race. Race is a social construction. I'm totally down for that. But let's say, given the way we all talk, everyone has a race except white people. White people are the people who have no race, and people just take for granted. They don't name it. So we're going to be naming it all, which will feel unusual to some people to have those dimensions named that are often taken for granted, that you're cisgender, that you're heterosexual, that you're white, for example the simulated patients. But across the, because we've got 200 patients to work with, we can have black people with sickle cell, we can have black people without, we can have an indigenous person with cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis and multiple sclerosis are underdiagnosed in indigenous communities. They're there because no disease is, is, uh, is, um, is really restricted to just one population. They're also there because people's ancestries are complex and they don't know their own ancestries necessarily. And there's European settler background uh, in indigenous communities to whatever unknown degree. And so there's, there are diseases that we think of as white European diseases in indigenous communities and they're typically underdiagnosed. So we get the chance across all these cases to present these different um, possibilities and so students don't just see one pattern we'll have like 60 or 80 cases that will be newcomers immigrants and refugees and people who are on temporary work permits or temporary foreign workers so on and that is compared to the eight we have right now um, a big change in the face of the cases and it lets us portray a whole range of immigrant experiences of racial background for immigrants of country of origin of how long they've been in canada of what their uh, experience of settling into communities and what their acceptance has been within communities. We can show all sorts of different, we can show very successful families and we can show the social determinants of health where things intersect and pile up and make people's lives structurally even more and more challenging without that being like, you know, the only case in the curriculum where there's homelessness is, you know, a homeless person with uh, comorbidities in terms of mental health and in terms of substance use and so on. Instead, we can have complex different pictures of what housing insecurity looks like and hidden housing insecurity where people are underhoused, where people are living with family or staying with friends and that is really a hidden version of, of uh, inadequate housing and inadequate access to housing, food insecurity, so on, different versions of that, what that looks like at different class levels, like there's different ways that you can sort of be living through and masking your food insecurity, really, when you're middle class and you think it's that you can't confess to such a thing, right? Uh, as opposed to where it's very visible and it's just part of your daily life to go to the food bank and, and you do share it with your physician readily. So across 200 cases, we can really show the individuality of different forms of, of identity and, and I'm really enjoying that. <laughs>
Yeah. And, you know, even sort of learning some terminology and language as you go along, being part of that committee has been really nice to hear people's different experiences. And I think it's important to tell the faculty when we're having this discussion that um, that is a very diverse group as well. And I think that we have um, maybe you could just speak to even the representation oh, yeah. on that committee um, to really make sure that it's um, not about them without them. Yes, I can tell you two things about that. We actually had some great news today. So first, the committee itself, and this is what's so different for me as a curriculum developer from 12 years ago with ProComp. Uh, we have um, Sorry Dryden, the J.R. Johnson Chair in Black Canadian Studies. We have Gaynor Watson Cree, the Associate Dean for Serving and Engaging Society. We have Brent Young, our Indigenous Academic Health Lead. Uh, we have so much more diversity within the group than was possible 12 years ago when we did the curriculum. It's really fantastic. We have to treasure these people and we have a bad habit like educational structures burn out their uh, black and indigenous and um, other, other priority communities, it's just to use some language we're using now. Uh, people uh, by asking them to do everything, but it's really made a big difference. But what's really exciting, and I can say today, I think, is that uh, Sarah Petal with Community Partnerships and Global Health Office has been working hard on a proposal for us to have the funds to be able to work directly with community and community groups to give input into the cases, to review them. Um, we've already been talking to clinical experts like about sexual orientation and gender identity and their representation in pediatric patients. We're having conversations with clinicians who work with those populations, but this lets us go to community. So it's a proposal for us to have funds to properly remunerate community for their oh, engagement with us. And, uh, and the dean approved it today. It's been Ooh, hot off email the press. back. So uh, that's hot off the press. That's uh, you're right. really that kudos was to Sarah like, Petal, right? Gaynor, and uh, Shauna O'Hearn at the Community Partnerships and Global Health Office. Oh, yeah, it's the missing link. We were, and, and we were finding that. So I, I should mention, I mean, I, I'm very, I wrote it down a moment ago because I hadn't said it yet. Um, so UTME also invested in an EDIA curriculum reviewer. Um, is Leanne Pickett's coming out of our simulated patient education program. She's, she's actually working with between the advice from the advisory committee, her own expertise in patient-centered care and, uh, and learner-centered educational materials, and the uh, unit heads and component heads and the case rewriting. She, she actually is proposing the changes to the cases and working with the unit and component heads and case writers sometimes to, to make the changes. Um, so. It's a great package. It's uh, we're really excited about that realism of it. Like, and I'll just say a thing, just briefly about the patient-centeredness because we were really concerned early on. It might sound like we're just dumping a bunch of labels on these paper patients, and uh, and it might appear that way to people. And we're open to that conversation. We're going to continue to have that conversation because there's going to be an upfront description of every patient in all these dimensions of diversity. So. What does that mean? I mean, if you don't have a patient-centered case that unfolds in the case narrative, then that really would be possibly more harmful than good. So as Leanne goes through the cases, she's also making suggestions to the case authors to improve the patient-centeredness of the clinical scenario as it unfolds. And there'll be a discussion question for tutorial groups to, to have that opportunity. It's not just we gave you a diverse patient, but no matter what tutorial in, you have that opportunity to discuss these aspects of the patient's identity as they impinge on the case. Mm. And do those cases go into not just the sort of identification and, and interaction with the patient but also, and their diagnoses, but also into like investigation and management and um, I guess a plan Advocacy. for people? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah, exactly. you knew where I was going yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I was talking about this at the curriculum retreat. I kept saying management, and then somebody was, I think, Emma Burns from um, Emergency Medicine. You she know, was, the you part of the network where we right? tell them what yeah. we want them to do. Are we still going to yeah. do that? <laughs> right. Actually, I mean, because I also have an ethics background, we're like switching all that language from we do this to the patient to we propose this and discuss it with like, the patient and like the patient agrees or doesn't the agree. Opportunity I would like to, offer. to try this yeah. medication. Yes. I know. So it's not just like like people say, of course, we're looking at language and wording around people's identities and what language is better or worse to use. But we're looking at that kind of wording, too. Yeah, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. And then I love the idea of tagging on, like, I always think CanMed's rules. I was always a fan of that framework. I'm, um, because I just love that it, there wasn't one that was more important than the other in any sort of size or sphere. It was really kind of almost, 
you know, this circle, um, framework. And then I think advocacy and getting out there. And so, um, I was just listening. I don't know if anybody listens to the daily podcast, uh, the New York times. It's amazing. It kind of gives you all the, my husband and I were glued to the, the hearings, the Capitol hearings last night. And so we were listening to the daily today and, uh, they were talking about Salt Lake city. So Sonia, you'll love this because Salt Lake city, the Salt Lake is going down and that, and so all the dust from, the shoreline is coming up and it's become this huge health burden on Salt Lake city. And so then I just sort of think it's, it's going to be healthcare providers that notice those incremental changes in patients and outcomes that is going to have to be part of the conversation about water usage and good policy around building and watering golf courses and whatever other things are contributing to the problem. And I don't know if we, I know we've touched on it. I know I've been very involved in it myself, but that is a huge role for our learners in the future. And so I get excited about having that as being part of the conversation. There's the, there's your patient and then there's the big picture. Is that, is that too big for med ed for med one, med two? Is that like a clerkship (laughs) competency? I I think it's coming from this. I think it's coming from the learners. So if we think about challenging race-based medicine, it was, residents in the U.S. that that started questioning these practices. When I think about engaging in the pro-comps, tutor, uh, the tutorials, it's students that are highlighting the, the inconsistencies in the cases or the potential marginalized populations that aren't being represented accurately. Um, and so I think the learners are going to be the ones that start bringing this to our attention and are going to be the ones that are starting to question it. And, and I'm optimistic that that they're going to be um, more engaged in that rather than kind of listening and, and taking things as fact, they're going to start questioning what we do in practices. And, and I hope that results in more changes. Mm-hmm. I don't think our students are too shy about some of these things. Like it's a different time, isn't it? Um, in a lot of ways. And whenever we talk about kind of the quote unquote, you know, millennial from a stigmatizing way ourselves, that word, um, you know, we're saying like, oh, it's a bad thing because they're into all these things, but we're purposely accepting people to medical school who have a more broad perspective, who are more representative of the patients that we see. And that's a really exciting thing because then they will be the ones to call us out on how we're not doing better or how we could do better. Mm-hmm. The, the Student Diversity and Inclusion Committee and the um, Program and Faculty Evaluation Committee, they've been working together on, on giving avenues for those students to, to be able to bring things to faculty's attention. I think us with the Case Diversification Group, we're going to be the first to get some of this feedback. And I think we'd like to see all faculty like enjoy getting that feedback, like learn from getting that feedback. Uh, we were just working on a case ourselves where the patient had been made lesbian and there was a question at the end of the case uh, the patient was written as lesbian, and then there's a question at the end of the case about uh, future reproductive counseling options in terms of genetic conditions. And I can't say how many eyes have been on that case, and my eyes have been on that case five times, and I share the identity with the simulated patient, and it wasn't until the seventh time I read it that we realized that in the last question we were assuming that the patient's partner was going to be the biological co-parent of his child. <laughs> and none of us had noticed it. So... Um, there's going to be lots that we want feedback from students from. We're going to be first in line saying, students, please give us feedback in this language and imagery form. Please tell us where our own blind spots were. Like, how heteronormative can you be? You know, after a lifetime of dealing with heteronormativity myself, I really, like, was really, I have to go think about that one. I have to go think about how many times I read that before I realized what was wrong with it. Um, so, I mean, you did mention the environmental um, issues and environmental racism. There's a long history of activism and policy work and advocacy around that in Nova Scotia and on, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't speak for New Brunswick. Let me, yeah, there is, I can't tell you what's going on in New Brunswick, but um, I think there's a new environmental or planetary health case coming into the curriculum. So hopefully they'll take also that race lens to that question, um, but students are certainly going to be asking us why we're not, if we're not, because because these are the students who are coming into medical school. Often, I can see the idea of putting it later because it's complex, um, but um, 
one of our working group members actually has been Eli Manning from Social Work. She's been a, a special uh, faculty uh, appointment this year in EDIA and anti-oppression for the curriculum. And she shared a really interesting perspective from how they think in social work, which is um, instead of thinking about the normal patient who is simplified, and medicine's done this for a long time, so now we have a ton of clinical trial data that doesn't apply to real world patients because it only applies to that simplified normal patient, right? In social work, instead, they think, think about the most complex patient. Think about the patient who really needs you and figure out how to practice social work for that person. And when you figure that out, you'll probably actually also be a pretty good social worker for people who have fewer challenges in their lives. So she's really been advocating all year that we reflect on that, that we take that thought on board, that we think about what if we thought the normal patient in medicine, the patient who needs us, is someone who um, experiences this whole complex history. You can come from a family where um, you've never had title to your land because, as the UN points out, the Nova Scotia government hasn't completed the process of regularizing black uh, Nova Scotians' title to their land from the 17th and 18th century. And uh, so then you don't have mortgages, you don't have the ability to sell that land at a profit and move into a better neighborhood, all the things that people think of doing to advance socioeconomically. So when your kids have a crisis or you need capital for to take out loans for your kids to support them in school, you can't do that. You might live in an environment documented in all this environmental um, racism research that you're next to, you're literally, you know, we put African Canadian communities and we put garbage disposal sites next to one another. So you're experiencing the health burden of your environment. You've been deprived of capital over generations because you don't have title to the land you live on. Uh, very similar things for Indigenous persons in different ways. With the reserve system, we deprived individuals of the opportunity to have capital in the land that they live on, the way that we, that many people own their houses and can draw on those and have extra funds and mortgages and, and build up wealth over generations that way. So it's all very intertwined and it all comes to play in those crises in life. So those life crises that come from health, those are often like, this is where we've got a whole framework of thinking about precariousness in health and security in health to address the social determinants of health in these cases. So that we'll be looking at where are people just at that dividing line where this family can deal with a health crisis. They have private insurance, they own their own house, they have a second property they can sell, they have whatever.